and it was actually terrible knowing that within a few years many would die and many more would be in prison and I didn't know how to reach them they were terrible to me I mean they used my equipment badly and they used to throw away footballs and steal the roller skates and uh, it was it was a complete mess and one day um, one of the uh, boys uh, I think he was about 16 I got really angry with him and I, I said you know what do you mean by treating this stuff so badly and he said oh we are poor underprivileged people here in the walled city in, in Hong Kong and you've got this nice church who's supporting you so that's how it should be and I said no there's no nice church then I lost all the good lot and uh, that was probably the best day of the beginning of the work because I was left with all the crumbs and they knew they couldn't get anything off me but we were friends and as well as the people from the youth club I was beginning to see the the rows and the roads and the huts full of men who were taking heroin and to, to visit the opium dens and uh, I was distressed that we didn't have an answer um, it didn't seem to be good enough to hand them a piece of paper and say you know register at such and such a, a clinic um, I was sure that if Jesus were here he'd heal them and I began to look at the Bible and I saw that he healed everybody who came to him everybody and uh, I thought it'd be wonderful to go down the lanes you know lay your hands on blind people and see them seeing I mean that that would be a whole lot more fun and real than saying come to our Sunday service you know, because they, they, they don't come to your Sunday service, they haven't got shoes and they can't read, you know. So it's, you know, Mguan Khoi they see, it's not relevant. And I saw that um, Jesus and his disciples had this power, and even when Jesus went, the disciples went on healing people, and Jesus said we were supposed to. Now I remembered that when I left England, I knew of a person whom I greatly respected, who's um, in the Anglican Church, who was reputed to speak in tongues. Um, and he had a very remarkable uh, and, and real ministry. So uh, I, I, I thought some of this might be connected, and I read more books. And uh, the, the sound of the gift of tongues was great because apparently suddenly you had words which you, you hadn't learnt, which enabled you to express all that was in your heart without being confined by the limits of your own expression. If God has anything from his spirit that will help me to be real to people, I don't want to just preach, then I'd like that. So I said, Jesus, that's what I'd like, and I'll decide what to call it later. I met this couple on the edge of the walled city one night, and as soon as I saw them, I just knew they'd got whatever it was. So I went up to this couple's house, and they came to pray for me, and they put their hands on my head, you know. But then they told me to speak in tongues, and I was quite annoyed about that, because I wasn't going to perform, you know. I thought, if God's going to do it, he's going to do it. So I, I kept my mouth firmly shut, and of course nothing happened, except I got hot. Um, and it was very humid, and I stuck to the seat, and I was terribly embarrassed, because they got this plate of oranges, and which was to celebrate, and this plate of flannels for me to cry into. And um, and all I could think about during that awful time was, oh God, they're, they're not going to need either plate. And uh, finally, I, I was so embarrassed that I opened my mouth to say, help God, in English. And when I opened my mouth, of course, he was able to give me a new language, which came up quite fluently. From then on, she prayed in tongues every day for 15 minutes by the clock. And I would say before I began, Lord, there are all these people dying. You want them to have life, and I want them to have life. Please help me now to pray for them with your understanding, because when you pray in tongues, you pray according to the Spirit of God, and he knows how to pray for those people better. And the extraordinary thing was that a few weeks after beginning to do this, I found I'd tell people about Jesus and they'd believe. 
And um, at first I thought my language was, had, had improved and my Chinese had suddenly got good. And then I realized I was saying exactly the same things I'd said before. But this time I was saying them to the right people. I was saying them to people who were all ready to hear, who immediately understood. This is where we used to find the sewer spiders. <laughs> really, it's because of your hand. I watch her so long. I think her come from maybe policemen. Every night, uh, dozens of um, youngsters used to come in. When I say youngsters, that was anything from 14 up to about 40s, but, but mostly uh, people in their late teens. And a growing number, I found out, um, were addicts, and of course they were all triads. I have a game of people, it's under to me. They in the youth cup fighting. They've smashed in the windows, broken up the chairs, and taken sewage out of the gutters, and painted the walls with sewage. And I didn't know why this had happened. She cried all the next day, struggling with the mess and sense of betrayal. Then she says she remembers that in the Bible, it says you should praise God under all circumstances, so with great difficulty, she tried. The next night I stood at the doorway, frightened. I mean, I wasn't frightened being beaten up, but I, I was frightened being rejected because I'd spent all this time with these young people. And I knew that it was my friends who'd beaten up the place. So I heard about that from our elder brother, Coco. I won't link to them. If you don't believe Jesus, okay, such matter. You're coming out, you're fighting. Just this, don't make Jackie sad. So this stranger appeared, um, and he sort of lolled against the door. And I said, who are you? And he said, Coco uh, sent me. And I said, um, well, why? Because up until that time, I'd never met Gogo, and uh, I just knew he was the head of the 14K. And he said, Gogo says, uh, if anybody touches you or touches this place, we're going to do them. And Jackie heard about that. Why you come to Youth Cup uh, to warning your people? This is not their fault. They will be done uh, because Jesus loved them. I don't mind. I refuse his offer because Jesus is looking after us down here and he said, Chisi, because um, his rank in the triad society was a 426, which meant that he controlled the fights. He was the fight fixer. And he knew it wasn't Jesus controlling the streets. Anyway, that was the beginning of my meeting with him. And every night he used to stand at the door, never came in, but he was under orders to watch me. So Jackie asked me, do you want to believe Jesus? I spoke to her. I'm a drug addict. How can I belong to Jesus? When I believe Jesus, I on drug. So I tell I tell you I tell you I belong to Jesus. I'm mine. So, so she say, if you believe Jesus. Jesus will give you the power. The power can give you the healing. You can get off the drug. So I think when it, when it, a medical. So I, I will want to try. I say, if Jesus can healing me, no medicine. They have power. So. Why not? I spoke to her. I tried many times myself. I get off drug. After one week, after one month, after one year, I will take a drug again. So she said, this Jesus, different. She give you a long life. Change your life. New one. So, okay, I will try, I said. He went straight into to that little room there, and uh, he started singing his head off. 
it, it was an awful noise because he can't sing, but he'd heard songs through the door. And then he began to pray, and he'd never heard anyone pray before. Um, and then he began to pray in tongues, which I hadn't told him about. And what happened was that this lasted for about half an hour, and during that half an hour, he actually came off opium. Thank you, Jesus. Changed my life and gave me a happy job. I still uh, keep to Jesus this night. Thank you.